That's right. All right. So I'll go ahead and read it. It says, um, so David is asking, why is it so difficult to love others? Thank you. Jay, do you want to give a first crack at this? Yeah, this is one of those short questions that begs a very long answer. And I'll try to do it as concise as I can, but yet I want to be thorough because I think this is one of the most important questions all of us could and should be asking. Uh, it's it's almost like what our friend Robert just asked about, hey, you know, I'm, I'm having a sin that I can't overcome. This gets us to very much the essence of that question. So why is it so difficult to love others? First, let's set a standard definition here of what we're talking about when we say love. And the best example of this is 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 7, which everybody's heard, right? And some of the best verses in, in the whole Bible, like love is love suffers long, is kind, love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in inequity, but rejoice in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, adores all things. If you distill it all down, what Paul is telling us is that very much love is other centeredness. It's a focus on others and you exist and live to serve and help and be there for others as opposed to being there for yourself. And Jesus also clarified that the epitome, the highest form of love is love that is self-sacrificing. He said in John 15, 13, no greater love has no one than this, sorry, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. So that is the epitome of love even to the point of sacrificing your life for other people. So what is the opposite then, or rather the absence of love? That's going to be a lack of other-centeredness, a lack of concern for the welfare or interests of others, perhaps even, even to the point of benefiting oneself to the detriment of others. And, you know, you hear all the time these sayings, well, everybody's got to watch their own back. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. We're all fish in a big ocean and only the sharks are going to survive. These notions are, are what sort of foster and reflect this concept of you got to be there for yourself. Don't, don't worry about love. Be there for yourself. Love yourself first and foremost. And this lack of love, this prioritizing oneself could be summed up with one word, and that is selfishness. And indulged unrestrained selfishness embodies the essence of sin. The lack of self-restraint to the point of indulging our carnal desires then becomes what we call lust. You see in Romans 13, 14, it says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. So there's this concept that our body, the, the, that's the reference to the flesh. Our body has these carnal natures, these desires, these lusts, and us caving into them and just going with them is going to be contrary to Jesus, contrary to God's way, which is mastering and subduing these things. Um, and then we see here Galatians 5, 17, it says, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish, right? So going back to like our friend who said that, you know, I'm struggling, I have to sin, I can't overcome. Yeah, we got within us the, the spirit and what God wants us to do. And we have within us what our body is telling us we, we got to do and we want to do. And the carnal desires have their origin in things that God intended for good. And I think it's helpful when we understand, okay, what was this supposed to be for? And then how has it become a bad thing? So God has made us, for example, to be hungry so that we get prompted to eat. Hunger could be a good thing. We want to eat food. We want to nourish our bodies to get energy. It's a good thing. But if unrestrained, we find ourselves just eating cookies and potato chips and filling our body with tons of refined fast sugars and other processed ingredients that are going to damage our bodies rather than give it essential nutrients. 
now we've crossed over into a realm that goes beyond what God intended of, of serving our hunger. Now we're letting this hunger drive us to, to not just nourish our bodies, but actually damage our bodies. Or even maybe even you might be eating decent things, but if you're eating too much food, you know, just packing on the, tons of pounds just because you're you're eating more than you should. That could also become a bad thing. So here's another example. God made from the beginning that a man and his wife should enter into a state of oneness emotionally and and physically. And to help drive this very thing, God gave them sexual desire. And it was intended that it would be awakened in marriage and that except to the extent necessary um, to, to, to propel the man and the woman to seek out each other and to seek the experience of oneness, it, it wasn't supposed to do anything else. It was supposed to just, again, like bring the man and the wife, the husband and wife together, give them oneness, help them to enjoy each other, to desire each other, to um, seek that oneness again just between the two of them. And what we see, though, is that Satan takes that good desire and he manipulates it within us. So he tells us that we should listen to that desire, that we should indulge that lust, and that we are entitled to indulge it with anyone we want. And that that feeling, as it continues to get indulged, will get stronger and stronger. The more we listen to it, the more we feed it, those cravings, stronger it gets. And and then this out of control sexual desire is what we often think of when we think of lust. But but again, not all lust is sexual. It can it be just pretty much any desire cravings of the body. So these things are example of like basic desires that God has placed in our body that were intended for good. And now Satan is manipulating it within us and distorting them to bring forth selfishness. So now there is another basic desire. So this is one that most people don't think about that Satan especially loves to manipulate us with. And this one is fear. So fear is a strong self-preservation response to an immediate threat, to an immediate danger. And it's supposed to kick in that fight or flight response so that you can either confront head on the danger or to successfully run from it. And that fear of heights, for example, that you feel when you like step up to a cliff and you're looking over like, whoa, I need to back up. Like That's what fear is supposed to do. It's supposed to keep you from doing stupid things that might jeopardize your life. But most of the time we experience fear in a different way. There isn't an immediate danger present and we're not at risk of dying in that moment. But we, be, we begin imagining all sorts of things that can go wrong. We're, we're just thinking, oh, what if this? What if that? Oh, maybe this could happen in the next few weeks, months, whatever. And now we're suddenly being bogged down by what's technically called anxiety. And on the flip side, perhaps we're reliving a perceived past danger. Something happened to us in the past that might have been very painful, very hurtful. And we're burdened by that. And that's what we call trauma. So you got stuff from the past trauma and we have what happened to us in the future or that we're afraid of in the future, anxiety. And it's by these things that Satan can manipulate us to be in a very selfish state. And, and we're not trying to be selfish. And this is why it's so effective to Satan because we're not trying to be selfish. We're just thinking that we're trying to survive. And this is why fear is so powerful, because we will do almost anything to preserve ourselves. Like, think about, it. would you be willing to steal to survive? Would you be willing to lie to survive? Would you be willing to betray your spouse or parents to survive? Would you be willing to betray God to survive? Would you be willing to break the Sabbath to survive? I mean, when, when you look at it, you think you're balancing, well, okay, well, my life versus you know, any of these other things, maybe they're trivial compared to your life is, is the way the an analysis might go in our heads. But look how Satan can manipulate us now to break just about any or all commandments of God by sim simply putting a gun to our head. And so the desire 
to love, we're, again, we're, we're called to love. The desire to love is perhaps one of the greatest desires and motivators. Oh, sorry. The, so, the, so we have this desire of love, right? We, but if it's a desire for love for ourself, it's going to be one of the greatest motivators uh, to cause us to do bad things. But if we're staying focused on others, it's going to have a different effect. And Satan wants to take what's good, these things God put in to us for good, and then manipulate them, exploit them to the point that what is good actually becomes the means by which he enslaves us. Remember, God, God intentionally made it so that we would want to preserve our life, but look how Satan turns that around and enslaves us. Hebrews 2, verses 14 to 15. It says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of the flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lives, the, all their lifetime subject to bondage. So right here we're being told by the author of Hebrews that we have been enslaved by fear of death. And this is how Satan keeps us under his control. We're afraid to die, so we'll do anything to preserve our life. So are you now seeing, I hope, how this verse even is, is more real and, and maybe have different eyes to this verse and how it fits into all these things. Why is it hard to love? Why is it hard to love? And this is where faith comes in, right? Because if we're living in a world where there's scarce resources, where you afraid of how you're going to pay the bills. You're afraid of all the dangers that could come to you, what people might do to you. You're suddenly now isolating yourself and you're putting yourself in a self-protective state and you're you're not thinking of others and how you could bless them, what you could give to them, how you can uh, love them and, and, and all these things. It takes faith to love in this world, in this broken, dangerous world where we feel like there's scarce resources and it's a dog eat dog world and just think of these two situations think of elon musk and he's walking down the street and he sees a poor man who asked for some change but say he pulls out his giant wallet picks out a 20 dollar bill hands it to the guy was that a great act of love by elon especially let's say he was surrounded by three or four bodyguards he knows he's completely safe Right? Not a big deal. But what if you are the average person with the average household, with the average income, and you're crushed by debt? You're crushed by credit cards that you've almost maxed out. You got a spouse and kids at home. You're tired from the day, a long day of work. And you see a dirty, sickly looking man on the side of the street you're working on. You're afraid of the germs that he might have. You're afraid that he might be dangerous and attack you. And then he sees you, you hold out your hand, and he asks you, can you spare some change? What is your natural inclination there? And then why would you not indulge your fears in that moment? Your fears of safety, the safety of your kids, you know, your financial security. Why wouldn't you indulge them? It would take, I mean, the, you, the grain of your body is, oh, I got to get away from this guy. I got to stay safe. I got to think of my kids. I got to hold on to my money for them, right? All these thoughts are going through your mind. It's contrary to, it's counter to the normal way that we are called to live this way of love that God has before us. So love this guy in the street. You're thinking, ha, he's the threat. Help him out. He's probably richer than me because I have hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, right? These are the thoughts that go through our minds. And the fact of the matter is, it takes faith to love. And this is why we say that the just or the righteous man shall live by faith. He's just, he's righteous because he has faith. That faith empowers him to live that righteous, just life. You cannot be just or righteous without faith. Not in this world of danger, scarcity, and intense desires. There's no way we can do it. Likewise, true faith is going to manifest in works of love. This is how the true living faith works. It's going to show love to others. 
we see this, for example, in Galatians 5, 6, says, for in Christ Jesus, there's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. These things have no value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So again, I'll say again, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And then we see in James 2, verses 14 to 17, it says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not work or does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what good is it? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And then let's say one day we realize we're trapped, we are completely addicted, uh, we're ensnared in intense, uncontrollable urges. How are we going to get free from this? You know, if we resist, we are likely going to find ourselves in an unwinnable battle. We usually cannot win this battle alone. I want to say it again. We cannot win this battle alone. And this is where so many of us go wrong. We try to tell God, okay, God, I'm going to do this on my own. I'm going to, I'm repenting and I'm going to overcome this sin. Watch me overcome this sin, God. I'm going to do it. Just watch me. But the fact of the matter is God looks at us with pity in his eyes because he knows there's no way we're going to get out of it on our own. And this is kind of what a lot of people mean where we need to just step back and we need to get it out of the way and we need to just let God do his thing. Because if we try to do it in our own strength, we are going to fail on this. We're not going to be able to overcome these desires, these urges, these sins on our own. We have to completely be broken on the rock of Christ and let him build us back up. We have to completely depend on the spirit to give us the power, the will, you know, even the will to do his pleasure. This is the only way to overcome this battle. And this is the battle, battle that we see Paul describing in Romans 7 to 8, where he's talking again about the, this, the law of the flesh and, and of death and the law of God and, and the spirit, the law of the spirit that's working in us to convert us, to, to empower us and to help us overcome these things. That's the only way we get out of this cycle. And this is why it's so hard to love again, because it's so against us. We want to do it ourselves. We want to do it in our own strength. We can't. And we have to learn to just depend on God. And, and this concept of depending on God is, again, essence of faith. Faith is depending on God's promises, believing his promises are true and relying on him to fulfill those. And, and so... Now we see ourselves, we're, we're in a world that's hurting, that is full of, of scarcity, we think. You know, we might not have money, and we see someone who needs it. Do you have the faith? Are you going to depend on God who says he has, you know, cattle on a thousand hills, who has immeasurable riches? Do you believe that? Do you trust that? Such that then you would actually put it into action and help others. And do you actually believe that God will protect you and that God loves you and he will not let you die and come to danger outside his determined time? And thus, you don't have to worry about taking risks at times to do what God wants you to do, to love others, to take care of them, things like that. I mean, it could go on and on, but this is why love is so hard and why we need to realize how faith is essential. And at the end of the day, the way we love others is going to reflect the actual amount of faith we have. And this is why we shouldn't be surprised when Jesus has that parable, right? And he talks about uh, those who, you know, took care of the poor, the needy, the least of these. He said, those who took care of them, those are my people. Whereas those who did not take care of the, the poor, the needy, the, the, the least of these, who just took care of their own interest and, and were selfish to care of themselves or out of their fears, again, were just for... For them, those are the ones that Christ says, sorry, you're not the ones that enter into to, to the kingdom because they did not have love. And without love, they were not keeping the law. And without love, also, they showed they did not have faith. 
and thus they disqualify themselves from the kingdom. So all comes together. This all comes together. The, the, the gospel, the law, the faith, what all these things mean, it all comes into what we just, we just discussed. So I hope this is something maybe even you'll go back and listen to again a couple of times, really dig into these verses, go back, read the whole New Testament, then the Old Testament, you're going to see, oh yeah, this is what the Bible is trying to tell me again and again and again. So Tina, do you have anything that you would like to add? I hope this made sense. And we covered kind of a lot here in this package. Yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, that is really a deep topic, you know, talking about love and, you know, what does it really mean to love others? And, you know, and I really like, though, the essence of this question, though, and I can't help but like think about this, um, David, what you asked, why is it so difficult to love another? And I know, Jay, you got into, you know, because we're, you know, we have innate selfish desires. And, you know, and like you're saying, you know, Satan does want to manipulate us to cause us to fear, to save ourselves or to have anxiety or have trauma to save ourselves, preserve ourselves, survive. And that's true. But I think too, there's also um, another aspect to it that I, I just can't help but think about, which is like a sense of judgment. Like if this is fair, like it's not fair. I don't want to love that person. They're hurting me. And I feel like that's something that, I, at least for myself, like I really struggle with. It's something I've been struggling with with a specific person for a long time. And I have to keep bringing it to the Lord and saying, Lord, you know, put love in my heart for this person and put forgiveness in my heart because I know, you know, I'm a sinner too. And I'm sure I've hurt people. And, you know, I, I know I need forgiveness. And so, you know, God help me and heal me in this, in this regard. And, um, I can't help but think about something so powerful that Peter wrote in the book of first Peter. So I just want to share this really quick um, as far as, you know, just when you're dealing with, you know, loving others, especially those who don't love you, who are being cruel to you, you know, like Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mountain, you know, Matthew chapter five, um, verses 11 and 12, talking about, you know, blessed are you when those, when you are reviled and persecuted, you know, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. I'm like, that is a high calling, you know, to rejoice and be happy when people are persecuting you unfairly. Um, you know, it's one thing if like, yeah, you hurt them and they're mad at you. Okay. You deserve it. But when you don't deserve it and God is still calling you to love your enemies, that's another story. And, um, like I'm saying in first Peter chapter one, starting in verse 21, I'm just going to read this. he says, you know, for e even here unto you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps who did no sin. Jesus had nothing, did nothing wrong. He deserved nothing bad. Neither was there guile found in his mouth. he never said anything. He never did anything wrong. It says in verse 23, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but he committed himself to him that judges righteously, um, who in his own self, in his own body, but bore our sins in his own body on the tree, basically on the cross, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Um, and so I can't help, you know, but think about, you know, Jesus, the love that God has for us, the love that Jesus has for us in that he loved us while we were yet sinners. He, and that's really the love of God. Um, but it is so hard when we feel like it's not fair. Why should I love somebody who's mean, who's cruel, who's hurting me? They're a bad person. They're evil. And it's only by love that love is awakened. And it's only when we realize, you know, we're just as wicked. We are just as sinful, but the only way that those other people are going to be called out of darkness, out of their wicked ways is through love. And we have to show them love because that's the only way they're going to see God. And so I think that, you know, it is definitely difficult. It's really hard because, you know, to love others, it's not always, you know, it, it doesn't seem fair. It's like, God, why? I don't understand. Oh, uh, you know, why do I have to love somebody who hurt me? You know, shouldn't it be eye for an eye? They hurt me. I should be able to hurt them back. But God says, no, I tell you that, you know, that to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And um, the only way that we can do that is with Christ in us, with the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. And that's why it's a, you know, the fruit of the spirit, you know, and, you know, uh, 
the natural development of love working through us is only happens when we allow, you know, we submit to God, we submit to his Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit then um, creates that fruit of love to other people. And it takes time and it takes effort. And so I think a lot of people, you know, it's a nice verse to say, you know, love your enemies. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. But in practical, you know, execution of, of this idea, it really takes a lot of effort. It takes time. It takes prayer where you really have to wrestle with yourself. Like Jacob wrestled with Christ all night, you know, um, saying, you know, I will not let you go until you bless me. I will not let you go, Lord, until you give me what I need, you know, which is I need love for these other people. And so it, it like I said, it, it takes time, it takes effort, and it's a continual process. It's not something that just boom, happens overnight. Um, to love somebody is really, it can be really hard. Um, but if we want to, you know, just like Paul says, you know, we're running a race and when you run in a race, you know, just like these athletes, they have to exercise, they have to do this continually. Otherwise they're not going to be able to, to win. Um, they're not going to be able to perform. And same with us. If we're not taking the time every day to surrender our hearts to the Lord and, you know, you know, give God, you know, all the yuckiness inside of us, then we're never going to be able to have that cleaned by, you know, the blood of Jesus and by the Holy Spirit to work in us, to will and to do of God's good pleasure, which is to, again, love our, love others. And, um, you know, just like it's, um, it talks about in Galatians really quick. I know I'm, I'm probably talking more than I need to. Um, but he talks about, you know, for, you know, love is a fulfillment of the law. And so if we want, Jesus tells us, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments, you know, keep my law and the essence of, you know, abiding in God's law and, and obeying his law is to love other people. But again, it takes, it takes an effort for sure on our part, but, you know, we strive forward to the, the prize, which is Jesus Christ, which is our example again. So, um, David, I feel you. <laughs> it is very difficult to love other people a lot of the time, especially when they are not lovable, when they're hurting us, when they're doing things that, you know, make us frustrated and angry or whatever it is. But, um, you know, I just, I encourage you to, you know, continue in prayer and to pray for these people and ask God to fill you with his spirit and his love because your to love in your own strength isn't really possible. You need God working in you because God is love. So I would just encourage you with that. <laughs>